Alrighty, so I think we can start rolling. Um, so welcome to our COVID-19 respiratory management uh, with a physiological approach. Um, and we're here to uh, share experiences, knowledge, thoughts, all in the, in the hopes of helping to uh, treat um, our many, many, many critically ill and, and, and acutely ill COVID patients. So um, I'm gonna start with asking Marco um, to introduce himself and uh, to start telling us about his experience and uh, the knowledge he's gained in, in Italy. Well, hello everybody, I'm Marco Garone. I'm an emergency physician from Italy. I work in Torino, uh, the hospital Mauriziano. Well, our, no, the knowledge we've gained, we've gained it from a lot of mistakes we made actually, because we were hit as a second nation just after China. And I guess we were a bit uh, slow in recognizing the uh, key features, key patterns of this disease. Uh, we started actually with a, uh, mm, what was the uh, intubate more or less as fast as you can these patients. So a sort of preemptive intubation after a very small uh, CPAP or an IV challenge. And looking back, we now recognize that this strategy does not work. It doesn't work for the single patient because most often these patients don't fare well once intubated. Uh, endotracheal intubation does not uh, prevent these people from deteriorating. And secondly, because it wasn't uh, tech, uh, feasible, counted the number of patients we had. So we started off intubating far too many patients. And this is the, the, the most important lesson we learned, it, and we learned it the hard way, obviously. Uh, so we gradually shifted from uh, very small CPAP or NIV challenges to trials. We shifted off to a more prolonged, uh, non-invasive strategy. And I must say that this has paid off really well because with the uh, percentage of patients that have been intubated has been gradually reducing. And I guess that we have a much better selection now of the patient who really needs invasive support. So this is it, this is the main part of it. Now, um, nowadays that you're not intubating, what are you going with as first line, second line? How do you decide what you progress to the next type of ventilation? Well, we usually start off with uh, CPAP and we try to keep them on CPAP as much as possible. Uh, we usually don't put them on an NIV unless they have a history of COPD or uh, signs of initial uh, work, um, excessive um, muscle uh, fatigue, or if they develop a, uh, let's say they are normal capnic, because these patients, these patients are usually both deeply hypoxic and hypocapnic. Uh, this was, is our strategy so far. And we've got people who are now, after two weeks of CPAP, uh, weaned and healthy and discharged. So uh, I guess this is the, uh, the key point. So that's essentially the proof in concept because those patients if, if a month ago, you would have intubated. Yeah, most of them I would have done it. So there's your, you know, certainly the proof of the concept that you can get away with just the CPAP on the patients that you normally would have intubated, but now essentially avoided, you know, ventilation altogether, which I think is the main question on many people's minds when attempting these things. Is it, am I just delaying or am I actually going to get away with it and, and avoid the complications of ventilation? Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, I think this, uh, we started with a, uh, let's say, one size fits all attitude that didn't pay off. Uh, we try to delay intubation as much as possible. Uh, obviously, we have a uh, sort of, uh, you know, red alerts concerning the history of the patient, let's say uh, diabetic, overweight, uh, uh, previous uh, coronary disease. These patients are obviously uh, monitored particularly carefully, obviously because these are the most likely to need uh, a invasive support. But we usually tend to uh, delay intubation, yes. 
Okay. Also because even the people who have been intubated early have stayed on the on a mechanical ventilator for more than two weeks on average. The average stay in an my ICU is about 14 days. Mm -hmm. And even for the early intubation strategy patients. Okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Marco. Um, and actually, it brings to um, Cameron. We we talked about a, a week or so ago, and then and certainly your your discussions went uh, went viral essentially, and uh, and you brought up a lot of those points in a very um, in a very uh, explosive way, and I think you know really brought the attention to this. Can you tell us about uh, your um, your experience? Um, yeah, so thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Cameron Casadell. I work uh, at Maimonides uh, Medical Center in Brooklyn. Um, you know, so right now in, in New York, uh, we are sort of in the midst of it where, you know, we can't tell if, uh, you know, if the peak was yesterday or the peaks tomorrow or the peaks, you know, two weeks from now. Um, uh, so we're really, you know, we're slugging through it now. Um, initially, uh, you know, I was working in the ICU um, and because, uh, you know, trying to learn from, from, you know, people who've experienced this before, specifically in Italy and China, and we we're, you know, hearing uh, uh, the high mortality rates on vents, uh, we did try to do what we could um, uh, to try to avoid that. And the initial thought was just to, if we can shave off a couple of days in the beginning, that we might be able to uh, uh, lessen, you know, the length of the vent run. Um, and so we started using high flow. Um, we had access to it, uh, uh, and so we started using it, and we were able to take people far. And from my own observation, uh, um, we were just seeing mine and my colleagues and the residents I work with were just seeing things that we had never seen before. And the clinical syndrome in front of me um, was perplexing. And I think that in some ways, one must reach that perplexed state of confusion when you stare at someone who is significantly hypoxemic. And by that, I mean, uh, you know, the, on high flow at a, you know, 90%, 50 liters a minute with an, probably an alveol or FiO2 somewhere in, you know, the mid 90s or, or maybe low 90s and uh, still saturating 80%. So, uh, you know, a major A gradient and, uh, and comfortable looking at you comfortable and saying they're not short of breath. And, it was that sort of perplexed state of confusion when we were trying to discuss whether they needed a breathing tube in the face of such a high mortality that, uh, you know, made me feel that this was a syndrome I have never seen. And, you know, what I have witnessed, uh, which is different than what I witnessed in, in um, seeing, you know, pulmonary conditions, specifically in a respiratory failure and fellowship, is that what this appeared to me to be, what it does appear to me to be, is a progressive oxygen failure, which in my mind is something different than respiratory failure. Um, and, and I don't see many patients on the verge of what we say tiring out. Uh, I see patients with progressively lower PaO2s despite the increasing amounts of supplemental O2 uh, that we're giving them. Um, and so what, uh, you know, now I'm in the ER and our ER is full uh, of critical care patients. Uh, we have a lot of patients on the floor waiting for critical care beds. So we are creating a, a team to try to take care, uh, sort of an ICU team within the ER to try to take care of all of the um, ICU patients. And, um, you know, one of the crazy things I have noticed about this disease is it really, it turns your hospital upside down. And by that, I mean, you know, you know, our hospital is used to having, you know, five, six, 700 people with maybe 200 diseases that we're very uh, good at treating, you know, uh, you know, it's a very good hospital and we're able to treat our usual cardiac GI conditions, you know, um, very well. But now we are struggling with several hundred people to treat a disease uh, that we don't quite understand. And it really, it flips things inside out, you know, for example, um, there really is no place in the hospital for an unmonitored COVID patient, um, meaning that we're not sending people home because they look good. You know, they they look. We're essentially admitting everyone that looks not so good. So people aren't admitted to the hospital if they look great. And those patients that are admitted to the hospital certainly follow a path of progressive hypoxemia. So they might look good today, and tomorrow they can be hypoxemic, and, and the next day. You know, they could be significantly hypoxemic, and yet most of our hospital beds, uh, as most hospitals, are, are not monitored. Um, you know, so if you could 
do whatever you wanted. It's almost as if you would admit him from the ER to a bed upstairs. And then in a day later, they got worse. You'd bring him back to the ER, which, you know, everyone knows is an impossibility with, with the system in which we work. Um, uh, so right now we are holding all of our high flow patients in the ER. Um, so we have a, we actually were able to secure a tremendous amount of high flow machines and, um, Unfortunately, there's nowhere they can go. Our ICU are filled with intubated patients and a high flow patient cannot, cannot go to the floor because they become fully dependent on that oxygen. Um, and were that oxygen to fall off, uh, for many of them within minutes, they would die. So, you know, how we're starting to treat it and we can, when we talk about later as far as ventilatory strategies, you know, how I envision it is an oxygen first strategy. Uh, um, uh, which is to say that, that everything that we are doing, um, other than the, you know, therapies to try to decrease viral replication and to actually attack the disease is simply to try to get the alveolar, uh, FiO2 as high as possible. Um, you know, so that is what we are struggling with now is at what point do you decide, um, especially with high flow patients who can talk to you and who feel well <laughs> to a certain point, you know, when do you decide uh, uh, to intubate them? Um, and it's, uh, you know, every day today, me and, you know, two, three other ER doctors were perplexed with multiple patients. And, you know, we all, you know, I almost joke that this is, it's a hard decision. It really is. It's one of the most, you know, um, difficult decisions as an emergency physician I have ever had. Uh, with these patients. Furthermore, you get to know them over a couple of days, you know, so by the time you're, you know, talking about intubating them, you may know, you know, you may know them fairly well. So, you know, I, I kind of joked, but not really, that really this is, should be a decision made between two attendings so that neither of you feels fully responsible. So that's sort of the setup of, of, of what our ER looks like now um, and sort of the, the struggles that we're going to, going through and sort of the I think the um, model in which we are approaching uh, ventilation. Thanks. I'm going to jump in with just a nuts and bolts question about the high flow since you've been using it a lot. Um, the way we've been using it is to go with as near 100% as we can and, and a low flow rate in order to minimize that, that theoretical uh, aerosolization uh, risk. Is that something you've been doing? So, uh, you know, initially I was titrating the FiO2 and now we're kind of, uh, we kind of switched it where we're leaving it at hundred percent and we are titrating the flow. Um, truthfully, um, we have somewhat, I think, accepted, I mean, many patients are on 50 and some are even 60 liters. So we somewhat have accepted um, the risk and, and it is just something that now we kind of, uh, I mean, we kind of deal with, you know, one thing I will say just to remind people about high flow is it uses a tremendous amount of oxygen. And so certainly if your hospital is going to embrace it, um, you know, uh, you got to make sure you secure your oxygen supply. It's it uses a lot more than a vent. Uh, it's sort of put it in context. It, you know, if you have 60 liters, a hundred percent, you're going through one of the big tanks, you know, the real huge tanks uh, of oxygen about every hour and a half, two hours. So that's just from a, a perspective of a, you know, uh, things I don't have to worry about that, you know, our, our other people are really busting their butts on the procurement of supplies and so forth. It's something to think about. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Scott, I know you don't have a lot of time. I'm going to tell us about your experience. Try that again. Yep. All right. Hey, welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to be amongst this and brilliant uh, set of folks here. Hey, Laura. Uh, I don't get to see you enough. Okay, let's get right into it. I figured uh, what I could best offer is to tell you about two patients that I saw on my last shift at my imaginary hospital, not my real one, of course, because I can't talk about that. So at the Janus General, uh, the first patient uh, was in room three, and this patient was sitting at 58%. Um, but he seemed to not realize that because he was perfectly happy and smiling and interactive and talking to us and initially got put on a nasal cannula by EMS, which was how he brought, brought to us at 58% and then a non rebreather mask. And uh, we wound up putting him on oxygen powered CPAP and his SATs came up to 
uh, high 80s and then would dip back down to, you know, 78. And then we'd ask him to roll over um, from, you know, sitting bolt upright to his left side. And then, um, you know, he, he had a pretty sizable belly, but we convinced him and he rolled onto his belly and he came up from 76% back to 92. And we just kept him that way until he uh, got uh, admission to the high acuity uh, four and uh, stayed on that uh, since I've been checking on him. So that was bed three. Bed four was same basic saturation, came in satting around 60%. Um, but he did not look good. Uh, and in terms of gestalt, what that difference was, was just what any experienced uh, ED or ICU doc would just tell you is the you know LLS score. He, he looked like shit. He just did not look like he was handling it. But he was still talking to us. He was still interactive. Um, but we, we had our doubts about whether we were going to get him through without intubating. And he uh, was a little bit sweaty and he didn't look great. And his initial labs came back and his D-dimer was, I think, 3,500 and um, his CRP was up. And this patient was clearly in a inflammatory state. He was not a happy hypoxemic. He was an unhappy hypoxemic. And we, we tried him on high flow. Um, we didn't bother going to CPAP because it was pretty obvious to us that at some point, in the next few hours, if we didn't intubate now, he was going to have a precipitous intubation, not because of his hypoxemia, but because of everything else that was going on. And these two presentations, I wish I could burn into the minds of everyone who has not yet had their COVID surge start yet, because you need to recognize these two different patient types because they are different. And we were treating every single patient initially, just as Marco and uh, Cam both mentioned, we were treating them initially as if they were both the second patient type in which their hypoxemia was the indication for intubation. But that first patient I mentioned is a very, very different looking patient. And if you choose to intubate your first 30 or 40 before you learn this archetype, um, then you are wasting a good number of your ventilators. So you must learn from our experience that happy hypoxemic is not the inflammatory fulminant COVID patient. You think those fall into that same uh, L and H category that uh, no, I think that that's a different categorization. That I, okay. I think all of the inflammatory patients probably, my guess is, pro progress to H. But you could easily make an L who's not inflammatory in H if you flood them with fluid and do poor vent management. And I'm with Cam on this one. I think I mean I hate hate anytime I have to go beyond forty percent on FiO two. I'd I'd happily put them on APRV before I have to raise up my FiO twos and a lot of patients, you know, there's some you have no choice, but, but the point is that's not these patients. These patients I think are high FiO2 upfront and then see if you need some recruitment from uh, CPAP after you get their FiO2s up. Awesome. Um, thanks a lot, Scott. Thanks a lot. All you guys, great, great info. Um, Rory, you've been hit pretty good too these days. Hey, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I'm Rory. Uh, we're down at Washington DC. Um, and we're basically, our ED is full of COVID patients, our ICUs, all of them now, all our MICUs and SICUs are essentially full of COVID patients. So, um, we are in it. Um, I think, I think everyone so far has, has said the highlights. We also made the same mistake as everyone is intubating early, essentially after six liters, they got intubated and we filled up a lot of ICU beds with patients on the ventilator that may or may not have needed it. Um, I, for me, I, you know, this, this disease has really changed, forced you to change like almost everything you know about medicine and critical care. Um, you know, you're, you're forced to question like what is an actual saturation that sustains life in an otherwise well looking patient. And then you're forced to ask like, how fast can someone breathe before they tire out when the disease they have is not associated with a low lung compliance, like you normally see in um, patients who have respiratory failure um, and don't have COVID. And then you're forced to ask, how do I get someone's oxygen up when they have no recruitable lung and their lung compliance is normal? Um, and so it really, over the past few weeks, has asked us to change a lot of what we do in the practice um, with very little evidence, which makes us all very comfortable about it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Laura. Yes. Yes, I got you on. Yes. Um, what's your perspective so far on this uh, point of intubation? Um, 
And um, how do you think we should go ahead? Um, well, you know, as, as uh, putting on my anesthesia hat, um, I too uh, drank the Kool-Aid of anything more than six liters or an FiO2 over 0.5, we should be looking at intubating these patients. Um, but I, I'm, I'm so happy to see that pendulum swinging back a bit um, into, you know, what else can we do for the normal lung compliance patient? Those two different phenotypes uh, that were just discussed uh, is, is fascinating. Uh, and so I agree with everything that's been said. It's just something that we haven't seen yet. Uh, I'm in Ottawa. Uh, I do anesthesia at the Civic Hospital. And so we haven't hit our big wave yet. We've just seen people sort of coming in odds and sods thus far. Um, and so, you know, how we've been dealing with them is actually, first of all, thinking about our PPE. And I don't think that we can have a ventilation discussion with these patients, you know, about these patients without first talking about adequate personal protective equipment. Uh, and I think that that's been, been a huge thing here. And I don't know about you guys, but I kind of feel like this is the first time in my career where I have to actually think, aside from the, t the odd TB patient or the patient with rabies, um, uh, <laughs> which does happen sometimes, you know, what, what's my health gonna be like after I deal with this patient? So PPE, I think, is, is the most important thing. Um, and so I really love the idea of high flow oxygen, just as long as you can keep your oxygen stores going. And if you're relying on those big H tanks, or even wall oxygen, that's become an issue in Italy. So um, I think if, if once you reach the stage of intubation, I think quite honestly, it's pretty straightforward. Don't, don't do dumb shit that you don't normally do. Uh, don't do it in a box. Don't do it, you know, with, with people that you've, you know, not had a briefing outside the door with before. Do it with profound muscle relaxation. Do it with full PPE for aerosolization and airborne precautions. Um, and these patients are, are, I don't think, going to be any different than the general population. Anatomically, they're not going to be difficult. I don't think we're going to be cutting the necks of a lot of these patients in CICO. But we know out of the Italian literature, almost 6% arrest post-intubation. So we need to have an advanced care plan for every single patient that we intubate. And we need to sort out what we're going to do should they arrest once we start positive pressure ventilation. Um, so that's that's kind of my take on everything thus far. And I'm just going to put a plug in. Uh, we're coming out with um, PPE paper, um, uh, encouraging a third tier for intubation and high risk procedures uh, this week. So I will tweet that out once it comes out. Thanks, Laura. I mean, I think uh, everyone's probably seen that hospital, I think in the southern Italy, actually, Marco, you probably know, that has managed with these, you know, really strict measures to have no... Uh, infections or at least no further infections to staff since they started and i think whenever these ppe discussions come up to me you know the the full the full bunny suit you know with the full face mask the papr air purifier that's the standard anything below that is is a compromise in risk management and et cetera, et cetera, which we may not have a choice because of you know one ability to decontaminate those suits the availability of things but i think Fundamentally, that's that's it. The, the max PPE would be the standard. Scott, wait, wait. Yeah, I I can't agree more. I think PAPR is it should be the standard for any hospital that could get their hands on them. I will put out one thing out there: the the disposables are tough to keep in stock, and so people were using for better or for worse. Uh, I've discovered a plastic bag with that paper hose underneath makes for perfect um, utility. Uh, you, you lose almost nothing. Wow. And so having the machine, which is infinitely reusable, you know, those filters actually last for uh, weeks um, and uh, that will get you through if you run out of disposables. So there's no testing on that. It's not, it's not approved, but <laughs> it will work. Uh, awesome. Um, I wanna give uh, Josh and Adam a chance to chime in here. Unmute yourselves and hop in. Oh, okay. I'm unmuted. Um, you know, I just, I just want to throw in something real quick here. And this is probably something we'll discuss a bit more in a couple of weeks. But I, I get the sense that folks think that once we intubate these patients, it's a death sentence. And I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, so far, we've gotten about six of our eight patients off ventilators, oftentimes within a period of about five or six days. And I think that you know, some combination of steroids, heparinization, APRV, um, 
may eventually work for these folks. Um, I'd be interested. To, I think Adam, you've exhibited a bunch of these folks. You're ahead of a couple of weeks ahead of us. I think um, we're lucky. I want to say most of the people on this panel, um, because of the brutality you guys have endured for us, uh, in, in the West Coast, we've been really lucky because uh, we got the warnings from Europe, from China, and from the East Coast. So our curves, our population interventions are really helping. Our curves pretty flat, and uh, we have low volumes per day. Um, so if it's like this on the coast, um, I think that's the big caveat and uh, why it creates some awkward perspectives for us too, because um, because we're not inundated, everyone wants to intubate at six liters uh, for infectious prevention, cohorting, those kind of things. So um, that's currently where we're at right now. But to your extubation point, again, because we're cohorting in units, we have a lot of RTs and nurses and a low ratio, we can mobilize patients. They're not overly sedated um, and it helps a lot. Um, I want to get back to point A, Laura, that's my favorite quote of this whole webinar is don't do dumb shit. I think that, that um, I think that's huge. I think right now, the COVID ocracy, the COVID idiots, um, whatever that new term is, is so frustrating with people doing shit they would never have done before this disease showed up. And uh, they're forgetting how to be the awesome clinicians they were before this. And we're, I'm seeing lots of harm, including intubating people that shouldn't and getting problems with the intubation or doing things while they're ventilated that you would never do in these patients. So I think it's the fear of the unknown and the anxiety. So sticking to normal physiologic processes that we know help and don't harm is, is the way to go. So to answer your point, Josh, I think the big thing is... Um, prevent early self-induced lung injury and people cranking in the hyper-inflammatory patients um, and then just help the lungs out. Don't crank them with tons of peeps that they don't need and worsen the dead, dead space, blah, 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 blah. Rory, let me, let me get you unmuted. Yes. Can I, can I just ask a question to the group? Because as far as when to intubate, um, I think the two patients that Scott outlined are, as you become comfortable with these patients, are fairly easy to differentiate. But, you know, these patients will test whatever threshold you set. And so a lot of times the happy hypoxic or the silent hypoxic, you know, will continue to look well and their SAT will continue to drop and you will arbitrarily set a SAT that you're going to intubate them and they will pass right by that and still look quite well. And so does anyone have any thought or what, how low do you go before you actually just intubate them just for purely hypoxemia? So I'll, I'll tell you, this is Cameron, you know, today we had that precise patient and uh, it really pushed our limits and the patient was saturating in the high 30s and I'm not lying, and he felt very well, uh, and he was on his phone, uh, and his, uh, uh, his respiratory rate was around 20, and his blood gas showed a PO2 around 30, and his lactate was 1.2. Um, and, and it really, this was one of the many we struggled on. We had other people, he didn't look like shit, um, and we had many others that did. Uh, um, we ended up intubating the others. And, and so, you know, this is, I think the struggle with this disease is that for me, even the looks like shit score throws me off. These patients seem to go through these, uh, you know, malaria like fever spikes and they look terrible and, and they can go from looking good to terrible to good pretty quickly. And, and it really is. It, it's just a, you know, it's a very difficult, all my innate instincts are just thrown off. And really, I find myself really gathering with other attending and just discussing because um, something about this disease is just something I, I don't think we've ever seen. Uh, um, you know, as far as the type L and type H, and this is one thing I'd ask to the group, um, I have never seen someone present as type H. All right. I've never seen these patients don't present hypotensive. You would think that if there was a massive inflammatory response leading to hypotension, someone would present late. I mean, these people, no one is coming to our ER that doesn't have COVID. Like, it is well known in New York that, that, that you stay home unless you, you really have to come in. So, you know, the whole, I'm very perplexed about this disease. Um, so, you know, to go back to your question, we're really struggling with that and we're moving our sort of targets up and down. And that's one of the problems. You set a target and then you want to change it and your target becomes loose and it, it really messes with your mind on shift. But, you know, one thing I'd also ask the group is, 
you know, and Gattinoni raises this. Do you guys believe that this is gut instinct and there's no way we can know that, that the transition from, from L to H is a natural evolution of the disease or, or it, it may be due, uh, whether, you know, in many cases we have to, to achieve a viable PaO2, but is due to our, um, you know, high pressure ventilation, which, which there is no way around it unless we find some other way to, to um, to achieve a higher PAO2 for a progressively hypoxemic condition. So quick question. So what did you do with this guy, Cameron? So he, I left and he was not intubated. Um, he, still in the, in that, or did you, he, he came up, uh, you know, so now we're at the point where really we are, we are, um, you know, we don't want to do anything that has uh, negative effects, but we're prepared to pretty much do anything that is not harmful. That may be beneficial. So, uh, um, you know, we have only two nitric oxide machines in the whole hospital. So we actually used inhaled nitroglycerin just to test it out It's a cheap thing. And we didn't think it would be harmful. We gave him dexamethasone, uh, um, and, and he's sitting in our resuscitation area being closely monitored and getting serial blood gases. And, you know, uh, we're going to look at the lactate and, and we're going to try to figure out what, what the best thing to do, but it's, it's extremely hard to intubate a man who he told us, uh, uh, you know, we're sitting there thinking about intubating him and he wants to let us know that there are, he knows people with PPEs and he wants to know if he can give them to the hospital, <laughs> you know? So it's, uh, it's, it's truly baffling. It's a baffling disease, you know, and I just, you know, I'm waiting for us to figure out what the true, uh, um, model what what this you know what this disease really is you know is it more like you know a uh, uh, pediatric respiratory distress syndrome and, and a problem more with surfactant is it actually uh, you know is the mechanism of disease similar to high altitude sickness you know what is this disease because because all i know is i've never seen it before any thoughts guys Yeah, I, I got to agree with Cam on this one. Um, I, I think most of the progression to, from L to H is probably iatrogenic. And he's absolutely right. Sometimes we have no choice. But I wonder if in many cases people are forgetting about the permissive hypoxemia that they were doing up until the point they finally put the tube in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you were tolerating 82 and the patient looks great and then he drops to 75 and that happened to be your number and you intubated him and then you don't want him to be 95%, um, that's going to be a pretty rough road to get to. And I, the, the steps it's going to take to get there um, are going to be anathema, I think, to those lungs. And uh, what's worse is uh, the, the FiO2 drops off in a lot of these cases too. Like people are willing to tolerate a high flow at 150, but then when they put them on the vent, they can't fathom 100% FiO2 at a peep of five. And I think the, the shifting of that uh, leads to a lot of problems. And then I, I don't even know exactly what to recommend for fluids at this point, except to keep them dry, but not too dry. Um, but if you're not, if you're a profligate fluid giver or the patient drops their um, blood pressure from the excess peep you gave and you give them a bunch of fluid, I think that combo might be where our H comes from. Yeah, have to agree with that. <clears throat> um. So one thing that I've seen sort of pop up and a number of people just comment was uh, the presence of these very sticky secretions and maybe combined with the fact that um, due to precautions, is it possible that bronchoscopy has been a bit underused and that, you know, this may be an issue in the, in the whole, um, the whole shunting. Any thoughts on that or people who've had a lot of patients, have you had secretions issues? Have you been doing any bronchs? Have you had a lot of plugging? I certainly haven't. I, I, I haven't found secretions as a big issue um, from our patients, either the intubated or the non-intubated ones. Um, and I don't know, maybe maybe there's a problem there, maybe because, you know, Gatinoni's theory that they've lost um, hypoxemic vasoconstriction. And so you are putting uh, blood flow to the areas where you have excess secretions. And so it's the, the less ventilated areas, it becomes a problem. Um, I'm not sure it's, it's rather diffuse. I'm not sure bronching them is going to make much of a difference. Cam, anything on that? Um, you know, I haven't, truthfully, I haven't uh, kind of noticed the secretions and bronchoscopy is one of the many things that unfortunately the, uh, 
you know, the fear of the virus makes it so we can't necessarily do all the things we would normally do to patients. So, you know, bronchoscopy is sort of uh, been clearly out of, uh, out of our arsenal. So I haven't even uh, really considered it. I, I have found that some patients um, do likely aspirate somewhere during this event. And, and we have had uh, what looks like some aspiration pneumonias and patients that sort of uh, kind of day three, four, five, start, start building up a white count and uh, do then appear to uh, kind of have one of your more typical um, uh, kind of uh, um, low compliance uh, pneumonia fever type uh, conditions in the ICU. Laura, I think you're going to say something. Um, I just wanted to ask Marco what his, uh, what his experience has been with bronchoscopy of these patients if he's, if he's needed to do that due to thick secretions. Uh, no, actually, we didn't perform bronchoscopy. Uh, most of all, because all the atelectasia we've seen were very small ones. We never had a patient with a major atelectasia in, a, in the emergency. I don't know about ICU, but NDD, no. So we never had a, a, a real issue about it. Uh, sometimes been proposed as for a, a, in doubtful diagnostic. Uh, we have a, a patient with clear clinical disease, but repeated uh, negative swabs to perform a, uh, a lavage. Uh, so we had just a couple, but just for diagnostic reason, whether to put them on plasmid or not. That was the main reason to perform it. But uh, we have a small number of pneumologists. Two of them are struck with the disease. So we are in dire traces for bronchoscopy. Thank you. Wow. Mm. Okay, well, I, I hope we, uh, we find out more about this. Um, so if we get back to some of the, the nuts and bolts things. So once you guys have taken the decision to, to intubate and, and just in rewind, it seems that no one has a really a hard, hard uh, specific sat uh, to a sat line, as you were saying, Cam, that line, uh, that line can change. Um, it'll be really interesting to see what everyone's experience shows on that. Um, once you've got them intubated, um, I think everyone's leaning more towards not using a very high PEEP, uh, given that you've got, or, or at least in those patients who have a uh, fairly high compliance. Um, do you have any particular settings that you guys like to go with right off the bat, Rory? So I, I think the most important thing to do is uncouple your PEEP from your FiO2 and your oxygen saturation. Um, the problem is a lot of people are still calling this ARDS, despite having a high compliance, and some will even say high compliance ARDS, which to me makes no sense. Um, but the idea is, the danger with that is you start using uh, FiO2 PEEP tables or some other way to, to kind of titrate, try to get your, F, uh, your oxygen saturation up using PEEP. And I think that can be pretty dangerous. Logistically in a hospital, a lot of times, you know, you've got these patients, people don't like to walk in the room too much. And there's this kind of reflex of RT or someone else just to turn up PEEP in, in the hopes of getting the FiO2 up. Um, so uncoupling that from the very start is important. You notice when you intubate these patients, their SATs drop immediately to very, very low, um, disturbingly low during the intubation. Um, and then if you do nothing, they just come back up. It just takes a few hours for them to come back up, but they come back up. So at first we would add PEEP and we would say, oh, they're, they're recruitable and they come back up. And I'm not sure we were recruiting anything because they had normal compliance. Um, we may have been you know, redistributing blood flow at the cost of, of lungs, um, but it may have just simply been the lungs, the SAT was going to come up anyway. We just kind of assumed that it was our PEEP that was doing it. Um, so we've, we've worked pretty hard at uncoupling those. The way we titrate our PEEP now um, is use a driving pressure to f kind of find the ideal PEEP. I think you also have to change your driving pressure threshold. You know, the, the, the typical driving pressure of 14 that we, we've done is people with ARDS. These patients have much lower driving pressures. Um, 14 for me is an alarm that we're already over descending them. Um, I find most patients at most need eight or 10 of PEEP. Um, 
And so that's kind of the simple approach that we've had. I've been playing with CPAP in them and getting them to breathe on their own. Um, that's a whole lot harder. They, they do have quite a respiratory drive. I think part of this is they don't have the encephalopathy that a lot of the patients we typically intubate do. And so it's their brain is intact and they're pretty hard to sedate and reduce that respiratory drive. Um, since we stopped intubating the ones that have uh, just hypoxemia and are breathing normal. Most of the ones we now intubating are already very tachypnic um, and have a work of breathing. And so they require really, really high levels of fentanyl to get them to breathe kind of normally and comfortably. And it also seems that it's it's a very sensitive trigger. Like you'll, you'll, you'll have them at 200 and they're breathing at 40 and then at 225 they're apneic and you're kind of like titrating to find that zone. And that becomes somewhat logistically complicated because um, you're just trying to reduce how many times you enter the room. Um, so it, it's troublesome. Um, and I haven't been as successful with CPAP as I'd like to be on these patients. But I think the big thing, the take home message from, from me is just decoupling um, your FiO2 and your PEEP. Yeah, great. And I think for those who are not familiar with what he's talking about is, uh, is essentially the mode of ventilation that he's been uh, playing with. And then some of us have tried here and there of just using plain CPAP no pressure support, no nothing, just titrating the CPAP to get the patients uh, on, a, on a relatively um, useful part of their, their respiratory function curve and, and letting them go from there. Yeah, so as a background, I, that's my primary mode of ventilation on most of my patients in the ICU, and I do it rather successfully. I've had a lot of trouble doing it with these patients. Their, their drive to breathe by the time you intubate them is really high, and I, it, you need massive amounts of fentanyl to reduce that. And we may be running out of that fentanyl too. Yeah, can I ask guys about that? Everyone in the panel, um, the experience with the dosing regime. I know Josh posted something today, but I'm finding that too. And I don't know if it's a mix between their profound hypoxemic respiratory drive or not. I know that um, there's some interesting stuff coming out of the UK with uh, maybe the virus attacking the respiratory center. Who knows? Lots of theories. But profound, like 110 mics of propofol, massive amounts of hydromorphone because we don't have tons of fentanyl right now, ketamine. Um, Presidex, clonidine, full concoctions. What's everybody's vibe? Because sometimes you're trying to slow them down when they're on CPAP. I totally agree. I, I like it. But um, when their rest rate is 45, you just get tons of calls from the RTs and then everyone trying to give them oxypine when they don't really need to. Yeah. I've had a couple of patients that were intubated in other hospitals and then transferred to us. And I think they were intubated with that philosophy of, of intubate early. And interestingly enough, um, those two had, I'd say, regular types of uh, sedation requirements. And then um, we had a, a couple that we intubated a little bit on the uh, on this sort of, let's try not to intubate. And and one of them, like, I, I think I, I had him on everything, including paralytics, you know, ketamine, uh, fentanyl, propofol, paralytics, then started some benzos. And it was hard to get him to breathe under 25 or 30 and, and get in sync and just sort of relax. Yeah, I find ketamine and dex that I love for my normal CPAP patients to encourage them to breathe does nothing for these patients. You need you need an opiate. You need something that truly suppresses the respiratory drive. And even with massive doses of those, it's pretty hard to get them to to breathe at a level that you're comfortable. Yeah, we're in New York. We're, we're going pretty hard on the opiates, and in general, um, you know, whereas in the ICU, we typically really want people to stay awake. We want them to breathe. Um, you know, we want their diaphragms to work and everything like that. In this case, I mean, our, our numbers are just so high that uh, uh, what I am saying is that after the patient, uh, you know, gets RSI, the goal would be that for them never to remember anything really uh, until you are kind of ready to bring them out. Um, and if that's one day, two days, three days, and, and partly that's because uh, we just have a tremendous amount of patients. And, and I do think that the synchrony uh, is not good in these patients. And unless someone's closely monitoring the synchrony, which as you said, requires sort of chasing, uh, um, it, it's just difficult. And I find it much safer. Uh, I even tell the nurses that, that do not worry, you cannot over sedate these patients. The average vet run is, you know, four to 12 days. So even if we shut off all the drips in three days and it takes them two days to wake up, um, I think it's much safer to, uh, avoid any dyssynchrony. I think that in general, the event management, what will be the hardest, uh, and this is within the confines of all the institutions I think we work, uh, you know, especially with very, uh, you know, uh, conscientious respiratory therapists is you, as an institution, you have to figure out what SAT goal you're going to be okay with, because that really 
will determine everything. Um, and, uh, 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 you know, if, um, you know, I don't like to go over peeps of eight to 10. So I typically will intubate them. And I believe that their vitals, this is what I, my sort of instructions are, their vitals before you intubate them should be the same as after you intubate them. I mean, that's what I've uh, kind of seen. And I think if you get hypotensive, you got to try to back off the peep. Now, if you're uh, setting already at, you know, 79 and you're hypotensive and you're on a peep of 10, you know, you got to figure out what it, you think is more injurious, you know, uh, um, you know, having them in a sat of 75 um, or, or pushing the peep up to, you know, 12, 13. And I, I think that's, that's the difficult decision, but I, you know, I see this as sort of an oxygen first, leave your FO2 at hundred percent and try to use as little peep as possible. And when you run into that uh, uh, um, kind of crossroads, which you will often between a sat you're typically not comfortable with and, and a peep, um, you know, around, you know, eight or 10, you just have to try to decide in, in a kind of unknown uh, arena that we're in, w which you think uh, is worse. But, you know, otherwise we keep them pretty sedated. You know, I like to have them breathing less than 20. Um, we are sort of ev every day running out of different meds, you know, so we run out of this and our, our, you know, our administrators work hard and procure this. And so every, you know, we run out of, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, rocaronium and then we use this and then we run out of all sorts of things. So every day we have to check with pharmacy to see what we have. And we've been pretty good at restocking, but um, that's how, you know, the approach we've taken is generally when you intubate them, be gentle as low peep as possible, high FiO2, and try to keep their vitals like they were. Cameron, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So my 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 concern, and we both trained under Nader, so I, I know you yeah. probably had this concern at some point that if you just if we just empirically set our peep so low without actually checking a compliance, we will start to have silent de recruitment over the period that they're intubated, and you're going to lose lung volumes over the course of their ICU. And obviously, at some point, you can transition from your, your L-type to your H-type simply by just de-recruitment and fluid and so on and so forth. And so my only concern with just empirically leaving their PEEP as low as possible rather than actually titrating it from a, a driving pressure or compliance is that eventually you might just start to de-recruit long. And since you've already lost um, or we think you've lost hypoxic vasoconstriction, that actually might make things worse as you create more shunt physiology. No, I agree. You know, and I don't, I don't really know a physiologic way to explain this, but this to me does not seem to be a problem. Um, you know, at least in the high compliance, low elastin stage uh, of de-recruitment uh, or recruitment, uh, which is to say, you know, my goal is to keep them in that stage. And when they move over into the high compliance stage, in my mind to have as little uh, a lung injury as possible, which I do think is likely unavoidably uh, from our events. And, and so I, what I mean by, you know, not de recruitment is, you know, we are proning people and I don't think what we are achieving when their SATs, when their PF ratios go from 100 to 300 is really recruiting lung. I could be wrong, but it does seem to all be uh, some kind of change in vascular flow. Um, uh, such that I guess I am less worried about de-recruitment um, uh, than increased uh, pressures, uh, um, you know, causing injury, which is so strange because this is absolutely the opposite, the opposite that I was thinking going into this, um, you know, but that's why I would not use APRV, which, which I you know, having trained under Habashi, you really, I mean, you really start to love it, you know, but why I just would not do it um, in a patient that was just put on the ventilator. I, I have often found I just, I mean, I, I never see the point because I'm not re-recruiting lung and they're, they're typically breathing enough to breathe on their own. And so my APRV just becomes a struggle with um, either they're completely apneic. And so I'm using my release volumes to breathe for them, or I have them on CPAP, but they're breathing too fast and I'm trying to titrate my, my fentanyl. So that's been kind of my problem with APRV. And I, I guess for Marco, I have a question. Cause you know, in this model, you know, I, I go to high flow quicker than I go to CPAP or, uh, um, you know, because I also think it seems like coming out of Italy and I'm really sort of, 
I look at you guys to, uh, you know, I really am trying to follow what Gatinoni is doing because I think it's the most, it's what we have uh, um, from a very, you know, experienced uh, and obviously very intelligent and accomplished uh, uh, person. Um, uh, but it, do you find that even with CPAP and uh, uh, that patients seem to be converting to uh, a high or a low compliance, uh, you know, high elastance state? Uh, sorry, Cam, I lost a bit of your question <laughs> because the, the, the connection is a bit wobbly. Oh, that's okay. So, you know, one thing we've been debating is should we, you know, let's say someone fails high flow, should we then try them on CPAP? And I guess I also have concern, uh, kind of reading the stuff from Italy, that, that CPAP uh, in some ways is no different than the ventilator in that you are providing, you know, if you put someone on a CPAP of 10, you're providing uh, positive pressure, which again may be completely unavoidable. And it's not to say that we, you know, there's any other thing to do. You know, I would, I would urge some place to put someone on VV ECMO before they get intubated. But, but do you, from your experience and from other Italians' experiences, it seemed like there is some um, lung injury or um, transition to, uh, you know, type, uh, uh, to, to basically type H uh, uh, with non-invasive CPAP. Well, uh, bear in mind that uh, in Italy, we, have, we haven't that much high flow. So that we don't have high flow machines at my hospital, whereas we do a lot of CPAP, especially with the helmet. So the helmet's much more uh, feasible when you have a large number of patients. And this, uh, lot, this cultural habit of ours of using helmets has been much emphasized now that we have a uh, patients overflowing. So it's much uh, quicker to use, much uh, easier. Despite the fact that obviously on a helmet, you don't get all the, the information you get back from a ventilator or from a CPAP machine. That said, yeah, we do have a certain number of patients that do transition from uh, the, uh, the, let's say the L type to the H type. But um, my feeling, uh, uh, we, we don't have numbers, I guess nobody has even good numbers now. Uh, my feeling is that there's a lot of noise now, we have to filter the, all the information we get. So I, I, I state it clearly, it's just my feeling, my experience on my patients, which is really a limited number, and that's a selection bias, okay? Um, <laughs> These might, on average, these patients do not transition uh, very much. That I would say that they're, mon they're a minority. The, our average patient stays on CPAP, doesn't get worse very much, has very long stay on a, on a CPAP machine, just like it has on a, on a mechanical ventilator. Can I, um, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, you know, as long as you're not titrating your CPAP up to really high levels, I would, I would treat CPAP almost like high flow. Um, most of your, if you take out high flow and, and, and non-invasive CPAP, uh, all your other um, oxygen therapies that are non-invasive, you just have trouble keeping up with the flow rates of the patient, right? And so they start to entrain room air. And so you never really get 100% FiO2 until you shift to high flow nasal cannula or CPAP. And I, I imagine what CPAP's doing, as long as you're not over distending them, is just you're matching the patient's flow rate so you truly can get 100% FiO2, similar to what you can do on a high flow nasal cannula. Laura? I just want to ask a question to the panel. Um, Rory, I loved how you said we need to uncouple PEEP from FiO2 in these patients. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. Just like when we intubate these patients, we say it's an RSI technique that has classically been associated with a full stomach with cricoid pressure. And I don't believe there's any role for cricoid pressure in these patients except under very specific circumstances. So we need to uncouple dense neuromuscular blockade and induction drugs from the use of cricoid pressure uh, when we say no bagging technique. Um, I'm wondering if we need to uncouple a high respiratory rate in terms of banging away at these patients to decrease their respiratory rate on a ventilator. Do, do we really need to do that or should we just meet their inspiratory flow requirements and just, just ride it out with a respiratory rate of 40? I know, again, it's a very challenging thing to not have them into our very predictable algorithm that we use. I, I mean, from my perspective, it's how they're breathing. 
on the ventilator, you, you know, doing it primarily when I work outside of COVID, it's APRV and, Co and CPAP. And you're always looking at their work of breathing and the negative force they're generating. And if you're seeing them take these massive flow swings on the ventilator um, and using a lot of accessory muscles, you, you're, you're assuming essentially that their transpulmonary pressures are high and they're, and they're doing lung damage. Whereas if they're breathing comfortably and you look at their flow curves and they're nice and low and flat, um, you're kind of assuming that that no matter what that tidal volume is, they probably have the lung to be able to do it. Um, from my experience, so, so that's to um, you know sort of really bring it down for for those of us that aren't intensivists, your goal is not necessarily to decrease respiratory rate, but just to uh, to decrease self-induced lung injury. Right, to make sure they're breathing with it with a safe volume and safe pressures. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I wasn't going to take any uh, of the questions live, but I'm seeing a couple of things that I just want to, you know, address quickly. Um, and there's a lot of people asking here about the fluids and say, for instance, I've got this one saying, if they get hypotensive with PEEP and they do not have ARDS physiology, what's the concern with fluids? Why do we need to be very conservative with fluids then? Another one saying, my question as well, if this is not ARDS, how does it change fluid management? Um, and again, still being fluid restrictive in L-types, concern that it's contributing to preventable renal failure. So, um, Josh, you've been quiet for a little bit. Um, why don't you, you, you field some of those? I don't know. Um, no, seriously, um, I think a lot of it depends on, you know, I think one thing, one theme that we keep on coming back to is the different phenotypes of these patients. And, you know, there's some patients who may come in after days of having nausea and vomiting and no PO intake, and they may be truly hypovolemic. And so there may be a role for those patients. Alternatively, patients who are euvolemic and hypotensive due to, you know, sedation or positive pressure um, probably will benefit less from volume. So I think ultimately you need to just evaluate the patients. I, I tend to lean a bit heavily on the history um, and kind of take it on an individualized basis. Yeah, I mean, my, my two cents on this is uh, respiratory failure patients really have to, you know, show me they truly are hypovolemic and not just, uh, you know, low uh, mean systemic venous pressure resulting in, in very volume responsive looking uh, dynamics, but that they really are dry before I give them any fluids. My patients don't get any maintenance fluids. Um, and um, I don't know what are your, what are your approaches, uh, Rory, Adam, Cam? I've kind of switched. Uh, um, so we're not, you know, we're not doing anything aggressively in either direction now, you know, so before I was kind of thinking that this um, was more of sort of a, a pulmonary hypertension, right heart failure, aggressively diuresum uh, kind of a cycle, but, but I don't know now. And I do think that uh, many of these patients um, uh, tend to get uh, at least when we, you know, ride them out kind of uh, on high flow, they tend to get pretty dehydrated and we try to get them to eat, but it's just sometimes hard. They feel pretty bad a lot of the time. Um, and I tend, I, you know, now uh, when we intubate them, so long as uh, uh, they're not hypotensive and their vitals are the same as they were, um, I, I tend to give them, uh, you know, a liter uh, over, you know, 10 hours. So nothing quick or nothing, you know, I don't, we're not yet putting them on maintenance, um, but, uh, I've sort of heard from shared experience from London and these sort of emails going around that, you know, what we once thought, uh, uh, may have been right heart hip failure and high pulmonary pressures, you know, may in some sense be hypovolemia. So for now, we're really just, um, we're trying not to do anything in either direction too aggressively. Um, but whereas I was very fluid restrictive before or kind of more advocating for that, um, I think now, so long as. Uh, you know, they're not hypotensive and I think their peeps not too high. Uh, um, you know, I'm willing to give them a little bit. Adam, what's your approach? Uh, I guess it's really hard to generalize because I think that the, the hardest thing for me is like this disease process is affecting so many different patient populations that it's really hard to say, oh yeah, everybody needs um, 10 cc's per kilogram because uh, that doesn't really work and you kind of have to see the person in front of you. I, I have screwed this up, I will admit it, that um, I'm cranking diuresis and moving on to patients quickly uh, and then when their dead space starts going up and they're hypotensive and the levo's climbing, I realize I probably overdid it and then other ones I have to go back to because the overnight staff, maybe um, the, the, the residents gave a bit too much fluid and caused some harm. So I, I, I'm sorry, I can't 
I can't give you a magic number. I think you got to see the patient in front of you. I, I think what Cameron said was totally right that some people they're on their nasal prongs, they're hanging, you're trying to mobilize, um, they're self prone they're texting, they look great. Um, they can keep up and other people can't. So mm -hmm. more free water through the gut or, or dear God, Josh's head might blow up. They might need a little IV fluid, but um, ideally through the gut if it's working for sure. But I, I, outside of this cytokine patients, I, I'm not seeing a lot of hypotension per se. To be honest. I, I think all of you guys are, are, are right, actually. Individualizing is the way to go. Um, and I, I've seen a lot of stuff about, you know, lung point of care ultrasound in the last uh, in the last weeks the last couple months um not so much on uh, you know on venous congestion slash cardiac stuff and i think uh, cam to your comment uh it's relatively simple you know if you've got a machine and you've got the time to do it you know you guys are being crazy slam but to take a look and take a look at uh, at your rv take a look at your paps or rvot dopplers ivc to get a sense if you've got or even just simply you know your rv to lv ratios if you're you know, if you have the knowledge that these patients didn't have any serious pre-existing heart disease, to get a to get a gestalt, you know, just of that with where you're you're sitting with your RV function. Anyone else doing some cardiac focus? Sorry. So I spent like, I think it was two weekends ago, now going through all the COVID patients and and scanning them all, um, and outside the few that had known heart conditions. They were all decompressed. I mean, their RVs were slamming. They had normal venous return curves. I didn't see anyone with any kinds of venous congestion. Now, we had a tendency to keep people dry, so it might be partly that. And and, and I think what what Cam said, because Cam said is right. They, you know, they're breathing at thirty and forty over a course of days and not really eating and drinking, so they they could be volume down. But I think is also a component of this this loss of vasoconstriction. I mean, their pulmonary vascular resistance is probably pretty low, and they. I, I was pretty shocked. I thought I was going to see a lot of right heart dysfunction and, and I couldn't find one case of any kind of right heart dysfunction or any kind of venous congestion. Which kind of goes against the, the pulmonary hypertension microthrombi kind of thing. I, I have to agree. Uh, I had maybe one and even then the, the RVOT Doppler looked really smooth, a type two at most, nothing too, uh, you know, nothing too suggestive of, of marked pulmonary hypertension. Um, Anyone else? Uh, Josh, have you been doing some point of care option? A lot of my patients have had pretty poor windows, um, so it's been pretty challenging. But I agree with you. I think it's going to be super important. Um, I found APRV to be very helpful, and one of my major concerns about that is that, you know, am I increasing the pulmonary vascular resistance, and am I going to get into, you know, renosarca and systemic congestion? So that's something I'll be keeping an eye on. Um, can I can I interrupt Josh? Because I'd like to hear your experience with APRB because I think the rest of us have found it fairly frustrating. Um, and you, you described some good success. Do you mind just briefly talking about it? Yeah, I've had really good results with it. Um, you know, we're putting patients on it pretty early. My preference is to put it put them on it immediately. And what I found is that patients typically recruit and their FIO2 requirements typically go down, you know, pretty substantially to around like 50% within six to twelve hours. Um, and then we chip away at the P high and you know, gradually wean people. I haven't had a lot of issues with CO2 clearance. And honestly, it's, I haven't had a lot of problems ventilating these patients. I don't know if I've just gotten lucky, maybe Vermonters are very healthy, but um, like I haven't need to paralyze or prone or do any of these things. And I've gotten a are, couple you, of, are they spontaneously breathing or are you using your release volumes primarily? You know, it's interesting. So th there do seem to be a different, a couple different phenotypes. So there's one phenotype where they're probably less sick and they're probably more of these like happy hypoxics who got intubated. Um, and those patients are easier to sedate um, and they can breathe spontaneously and kind of synchronize well and be beautiful and awake and just awesome on the ventilator. I think there are a couple other patients who are more of like a cytokine storm phenotype um, who are harder to sedate and have kind of larger um, tidal volume requirements and more air hunger and tachypnea. And they're kind of similar to those patients that you were describing where it's really difficult to kind of get them to not take like 800 cc tidal volumes at a rate of 50. And then, so you're, you're, are you paralyzed or you're just sedating the hell out of them using your release volumes to ventilate? The, the latter. I really just dislike paralysis. We're putting everyone on steroids. And then I think, well, also, first of all, we're running out of cystatricurium, but I think if we put everyone on steroids and paralyzed, then we're going to see a lot of myopathy. And then, sorry, I'm, I'm hogging everything. Um, your P high settings around, where, where are they in, initially? I'll typically start at 30 and then chip away, um, you know, over a period of days. 
Okay. Are you finding problems with hypotension or no? I haven't initially. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I've had the opposite. I, I, you know, I the few ones I've run on APRV, um, the, the P high of eighteen or nineteen would give me massive release volumes because their compliance is so good. So I haven't really even had to use true APRV settings, and then the ones that you can get, they're essentially go to CPAP reasonably quickly. Um, but like you said, I think at this point, these are the patients I'm no longer intubating um, and just riding them out on non-invasive. And so by the time the patients get sick enough to be intubated, they become that air hunger patient, which is much harder to run on CPAP or APRV. All right, let me just change gears a little bit here as time's moving along and um, weaning these patients. So from, from uh, what I've been hearing, and I, I haven't gotten really to this, that stage yet in our wave, but um, people pass weaning parameters essentially do well, but then um, and sometimes fail and need to be reintubated. So what have you guys been using as, a, uh, as strategies for, for weaning and extubation or, or the, the decision to extubate? Felipe, um, yeah. can I just cut in here? Before, before we get to weaning, can, can I hear from the members of the panel about prone positioning, proning the awake patient on you know, high flow or on CPAP and then proning the uh, awake patient who is intubated, just what people's experiences have been. It just seems like it's sure. become we, huge around Twitter now. Yeah, we, we, uh, we skipped on that point, I think a little bit. We've certainly been using proning right from the get-go on the patients on just nasal cannula, the ones that are completely fine. Just tell them, okay, flip, spend so many hours on your, on your belly, try to sleep on your belly, et cetera. And same for the uh, for the high flow nasal cannula patients. We keep you know we keep flipping them, getting them to do as, as much moving as as they can, and that's been really well. We've got a, f a few patients we've been riding like that who, you know, were a little bit you know borderline. Uh, uh, we're requiring a fair bit of high flow, and by the earlier criteria, certainly would have been intubated. But just with uh, the high flow and uh, or nasal cannula and lots of self proning, I think that works very well. Um, I think for the for the ventilated patients, I think it's still up in the air whether or not we really need to go on this regular kind of proning routine. Uh, the rest I of think care. we have a branding problem. <laughs> I think it's like everyone proning or paralysis, you need a team of eight. I think we need to call it adult tummy time. The pediatricians are right. <laughs> that like, just let them do what they do in bed and let them roll around. Like um, nursing colleagues love it because you're just like, yeah, move around in bed. You're fine, right? And everyone is so fixated on the safety and the protocol. I don't know about you guys, but you're on six liters of nasal prong. Move around in bed, man. Do, do, if you feel comfortable on your stomach, try it because as long as you don't have any other issues. So I think branding is the problem. I'm, maybe because I'm a father of young children, adult tummy time just seems easy. No, I have, I have a question. So I, I've encountered a bunch of patients who have morbid obesity <laughs> and they can't lay on their belly. And I, so my question is, should we just give up on the proning or would it be beneficial to have them lay on one side and then lay on the other side and lay and, you know, go back and forth? Yeah, I think proning is even a misnomer. Like the way we do it is they, they lay on their belly, they turn on their side, they turn on the other side, they sit straight up and then they start that routine again. I don't think it's just yeah. proning. I think I think one of the problems that we have to we have to get across is again, like we're not like we have to get away from calling this ARDS. We have to stop thinking about proning as a way to re-recruit. We're shifting blood supply, right? And and so you're just gonna try to experiment which way actually shifts the blood supply the best. Um and it, Cam said this really well a couple of weeks ago this is a disease of progressive hypoxia that at some point is going to hypoxemia excuse me that at some point is going to stop and so you're just buying time and 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 the proning is just a way to hopefully buy time to keep them off the vent and hopefully that the disease process stops before you get to the vent sometimes i wonder if you know the benefit of all this is uh you know it's probably good for every patient in the ER to prone at night. I wonder if this will break down the wall and, you know, this will just be a thing in ERs from now on, you know? <laughs> Our exclusion criteria is if the patient can't prone themselves, you shouldn't be proning them awake, right? Like they should just be able to flip over and do it themselves. Yeah, good point, good point. We started ventilating patients in a sitting position. If they can afford it, we put them also sitting because you know, just to shift the blood flow around. Yeah. Um, now I have one question about that just for the panel. You know, have you noticed that patients, the SAT will get better. And, and so we feel better, 
But have you noticed if do do patients seem to feel better when they're prone? Some do, yeah. I would say that some do, and most likely those are the ones who will benefit most because they they if especially if they do self proning, these are the ones who will continue. It, it's easier to have them. I, I talk about just unventilated, uh, non intubated patients. Yeah. Now, what I worry sometimes is that the patients that don't feel well, and then we prone that look better, but still don't feel well, I, I get a little concerned about because their number gets better, which makes us feel better. But, you know, I know that what's going on doesn't appear to be sustainable. Um, um, so, yeah. but we're proning, I mean, we're advocating it and, you know, even the nurses are pushing them to do it. And Actually, before, uh, before I get to, to the, uh... To the weaning part, I want to get Marco to tell us a little bit, and and Josh, because uh, you guys, uh, Marco, in the field, brought us up, and and Josh really nice, gave us a nice polish on the concept of uh, of splitting. Um, Marco tweeted out a picture uh, a week ago or so that was fairly controversial, at least in some circles, but uh, was clearly out of necessity. Uh, we're hoping, or many of us are hoping, not to get there, but it, by the sounds of it, maybe in New York, you're getting close. Can you tell us a bit about that, Marco? Sorry to interrupt. I just have to run to work. So I'm going to, I'm going to see you guys. Thanks so much. Rory. Rory. See you, Rory. Stay healthy. Bye, Rory. It's a pleasure. Good seeing you, Rory. You too. Well, so the splitting thing was actually, uh, obviously, as you said, done out of sheer necessity. Uh, we had run out of vents. We had run out of helmets. Uh, the choice of these either leave a patient with a, a PF of 120 or 150, on nasal cannulas or share a ventilator. And so we did the splitting. And I, as I said most many times, uh, I, I have done it because we were getting into a sort of warlike scenario. And when we did it, also we didn't really know what was gonna be the curve. We were just, we had in mind that we were just about to be hit by the sort of mass casualty scenario, which actually wasn't what happened actually because we thought of it like a, a tsunami and it wasn't it was just a very a slow tide rising constantly rising up so uh, at one point we got out run out of plants but it didn't happen anymore so uh, we just had eight patients who were uh, on the split vents and they fared more or less just like the others uh, three were, we, were weaned, one has already been discharged, two have been intubated. I would say that the rates of the uh, worsening were more or less average. Uh, I would still do it just as an emergency measure. Uh, I, I also devised a little gizmo to split a single limb ventilator, but I didn't publish it because I thought this is going to stir more controversy than it was going to be beneficial. So. Uh, uh, I'll leave. Uh, I've left it up to my nurses. Just you know, say if you need to split a single limb vent, th this is the trick to do it. I did it using a cutoff from a nasal cannula, but uh, I, I discuss about it on a uh, Slack group, and and that that's it. I don't, I don't want to stir any <laughs> other controversy about it. Well, you can send it to us, and we'll keep it in our back pockets just in case. <laughs> okay. Josh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting question. I don't think there's a really simple answer to it. There, there are two issues at hand here. I think one is splitting non-invasive, which I think is what you did, right? Yeah, that's yeah so, that. so that makes a ton of sense to me, and I think that's safe, and I think that's a great thing to do. Um, so I, I don't think there's a lot of controversy there. I think um, there would probably be a bit more controversy about splitting invasive mechanical ventilation because the problem then is that you basically need to do pressure controlled continuous mandatory ventilation. So you need to deeply sedate or paralyze the patient. Um, you know, personally, I'd rather do that than, than watch someone die. Um, so I don't know. That's the logic. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So let's get back to that weaning, weaning decisions. I think we've probably only got, uh, got Cam here and, uh, and, and Josh to, to tell us about weaning of these patients and decisions and, and maybe Adam. So Cam. Uh, so truthfully, I, you know, I, I moved from the ICU to the ER, uh, you know, so I've been sort of following what they've been doing up there, um, you know, but I haven't been heavily involved in the weaning uh, part. You know, I will say that a, a lot of the patients 
uh, from what I'm hearing and when I talk to the residents up there and, and so forth that um, uh, it seems that it, it's more prolonged than one would expect, you know, uh, than the sort of usual stepwise uh, kind of transfer the work onto the patient and then, you know, hopefully take the ventilator off. And what I've heard from other units in the institution is that, yeah, people seem to, uh, to get there and then you sort of drop the peep and they get to Kipniak and they sort of just fail those trials. Um, uh, so, uh, I mean, we have had patients extubated and, and successfully, um, you know, what I always wonder is, um, you know, I wish we could know, you know, we just knew a number from one to 20 about the severity of someone's disease, you know, and, and is it possible that, you know, in some sense, uh, those with very severe disease, no matter what we do, are the ones that are difficult to get off, uh, um, you know, which is hard to say, but, but I wish I could say more about, you know, the weaning process, but I'll, I'll listen to you guys and, and take your advice. To, to kind of speak to your concept of a number, I think um, one belief that I had based on, you know, one of the earlier patients I had was, you know, we put the patient on ventilation, they got a lot better, they're doing great, but their inflammatory markers are like sky high. Um, and there's a tendency to wean and we start trying to wean down and then the patient gets worse. So I do think that there are different phases of illness. I think if the patient's inflammatory markers are super high and their lungs are just on fire, you're probably not going to have a lot of success. Um, so we've started kind of hitting these patients with steroids or higher doses of steroids or tosylizumab, various things to get the, the markers down. Once the markers are kind of down and the patients have improved, I've been okay kind of weaning patients in a somewhat more aggressive way than I thought would be capable. Initially, there were a number of reports similar to what you're referring to about patients kind of getting off the vent and falling apart. Um, and that hasn't been my experience so far. We've gotten six patients off the vent. Um, and I was there for five, I was kind of like right around the ICU for five of them. We're typically exhibiting people to um, non-invasive CPAP, you know, or BiPAP ideally. Um, and we haven't actually seen a lot of deterioration. I've been happy to see that. What about you, Adam? You probably exhibited more than I have. I think we're, we're, I, how to put this? I, I think the high compliant patients are really easy to wean early because um, that's not a problem. Get them onto spontaneous modes, whatever your du jour is. Um, get them mobilizing. And like you said, wait until that inflammatory phase, if they're heading into it or coming out of it, is resolved. And then extubate them. I, I think the, the trouble we've had, a very small population, is the ones you have problems weaning in normal diseases, right? You're 80, you're comorbid, you're weak, you got steroids. Now you have critical illness, acquired maybe neuropathy, myopathy. Um, you had some vent dyssynchrony, you had compliance issues, so we really sedated you, you're delirious, those kind of things. So I, but I don't think that's the vast majority of patients we're seeing. Uh, I think the troubling ones, because they have long vent um, courses, but those are, those are the ones that we're experienced to anyway. So the, the, High compliant ones, get them spontaneously breathing, watch their fluid status judiciously, don't overdo it, don't underdo it, mobilize, mobilize, mobilize. Yeah. Thanks. Laura, I think you were going to ask something. Um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to hear the panel's um, thoughts on extubation of the COVID patient and what they're, if you think that they're still um, uh, a high risk aerosol generating medical procedure. You know, we're, we're seeing patients come to the OR for sometimes completely unrelated um, procedures and, uh, you know, the who are COVID positive and, and or assumed COVID positives, you know, pending testing. And, you know, I, my thought is that extubation is, is just as high risk, if not more high risk, because I actually don't have a paralyzed patient anymore. They are spontaneously ventilating. We're asking them to do all the maneuvers that actually cause aerosol generation uh, while we're taking out the tube. And, and so our approach to that is, is full high risk aerosol generating medical procedure, PPE. Um, is, that, is, is that being used, you know, these, these patients that are being extubated 10 to 14 days after they've been intubated? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it is an aerosol generating procedure. So we're using full PPE, we're using negative pressure rooms. Um, one point of kind of controversy is whether or not you can extubate patients to high nasal cannula or CPAP. Initially, there was some concern about that. Um, but we are doing that. The ANZICS guidelines said it was okay to do that. And um, I'd like to believe kind of being maybe an optimist, perhaps a stupid optimist that over time, the viral load may decrease a bit. So 
if we're extubating someone after a week of illness, they're probably not quite as like a nuclear viral thing as when they're first intubated. But you're still using full precautions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, sure, sure. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's so. That's a nice point, Josh, of uh, of everyone going straight to um, straight to a mode of support, nonetheless, post extubation. Um, like I said, I haven't extubated any yet, um, but that may be a way to go. Given that there's been a few reports of people deteriorating, sort of, we're kind of used to once someone's passing this VT, they're extubated, they look good for an hour. Fairly unusual that they require intubation five, six hours later or 12 hours later, but apparently this seems to have been an issue. So maybe a uh, NIV or, or at least high flow right off the bat uh, is a good thing. Yeah, yeah, because that would be the approach we would do in somebody who had kind of still inflamed lungs or just recovering, right? That um, versus a normal patient or anything that didn't have lung pathology, who you would fly to no problem. But um, I think that's the problem, not fear, appropriate fear, um, but for people not doing, again, like Laura said, don't do dumb shit. You wouldn't ex extubate someone with who still had some nasty looking lungs, but had minimal support. You wouldn't just extubate them to two liters. You'd probably extubate them to CPAP, especially if they're 80 and is on home CPAP anyways, and has a big belly. But I think this fear of aerosolization um, and questions about different levels of PPE is preventing people from doing the things we should do for our patients. So learning from Marco and everybody in Italy and Europe and cohorting patients, I think is really important. So all your staff for their shift are on the appropriate PPE and you're doing things like extubating beside you, the, the guy around the corner is on high flow, the gals on CPAP and, and you can do that. But knowing that these areas are a bit of a war zone probably for viremia and you appropriately have to have this, the correct PPE and precautions. Nicely said, Adam. I've got a little interesting and appropriate little questions here since we're talking about weaning that popped up. And and anyone who's listening, please don't. Uh, I'm not playing favorites. I don't. I haven't been looking at the the stream the whole time. But someone just asked uh, a Dr. Shaikh about any thoughts on the timing of tracheostomy if indicated. Um, my thoughts here would be that since we have a, f a almost I think. Um, Cameron said this when we spoke last time, it, the virus seems to turn itself off and people get better quickly. So I have a feeling that we're probably going to hold off most trachs in a, you know, sometimes, you know, everyone goes be somewhere between a week to two weeks or something like that. Probably try to stretch it out to that two weeks. That's what uh, we're sort of uh, informally planning to do. I don't know if anyone else has actually done any trachs on these patients. Uh, and Josh, you, you, you barely need to ventilate them. So uh, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Cam, have you seen trachs? Being done? Uh, uh, so far, um, we haven't been doing trachs, but there's, you know, now we have patients that are, are you know, pushing that time frame, And so there are discussions and, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what, uh, what comes of it. Um, how about Marco? Are they doing, you know, for prolonged, uh, you know, uh, vent runs, are they doing trach for sort of pulmonary rehab? Well, right now they're doing it in my hospital, but we have a huge issue that is we have a, such an overflow of patients that most of our uh, post ICU units have been uh, shifted into a uh, COVID ordinary yeah. hospital wards. So the, we have a huge problem of where to put the patient after he's been discharged from the ICU. And yeah. this, this, is going, this might be a, a limiting factor to, to trach. If you, if you, any, any, just as, a, as a, with intubation, any trach that could be avoided, despite for the patient, it's also, uh, that would increase, let's say, make the, the whole system smoother. Because they, it's very likely that we won't have any rehab place in, in, in the near future. So we might, uh, let's say, uh, delay the mortality uh, into a, let's say a, a very late phase because of inadequate care. So uh, I think that's an issue. Lucky I'm not an anesthesiologist. <laughs> I, I'd love to reiterate that, Marco. We're having that problem too, as just um, there's the issue logistically, do you have bedside perk trach or do you an open trach? What's less aerosolizing, et cetera? I think that's a different argument. Um, but where does a COVID trach go? We, 
we don't know in our hospital. We don't have that workflow yet. And um, smarter people than me, unfortunately, are going to have to figure that out. Uh, but that is a thing that ideally, I think for rehab, it would be the way to go. But there's a huge issue that, um, where do you put them? Yeah, good question. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Ross to, to feed me a couple of the better, more and more pertinent questions to this that he's uh, seen pop up so far. Um, otherwise, do you guys have any other, any other things that we haven't really talked about too much on the on a respiratory sense so far. Can I um, can I ask the panel? Uh, you know, Scott mentioned um, a papper using a, a clear plastic bag. Um, there's there's a lot of things coming. You know, I made a I, I made a comment about you know the box, uh, the intubation box, and and I, I find that there's a lot of MacGyvering coming up. Um, I think it's our fear of running out of appropriate PPE um, uh, in the setting of our fear of our own health and, and safety. Uh, and I'm just, uh, I just wanna ask the panel out of curiosity, uh, are you doing MacGyverisms in your ICU, in your emergency room, um, in order to uh, cover things that, uh, that you're having supply issues with? We've done a little bit in terms of uh, those tricks to preserve N95s because it, it's, it's almost comical how a week previous or a few days previous say, no, 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 we're not keeping, throw them all away. And then uh, there's this, um, you know, this directive, so, well, now we have to save them, you put them in a bag and we'll try to, uh, we'll find a way to, to clean them up. And then they end up handing nurses sometimes, well, here's your N95 for the day, you know? And so we, we MacGyvered uh, those, uh, you know, a way to, to take it off, you know, safely put it in a, put it in a, in a sort of a container with uh, looping the loops around in order to be able to put it back again without contaminating yourself when you put it on and off, et cetera. Um, I mean, that's about the MacGyvering that, uh, that we've uh, had so far. <laughs> For us in New York, you know, we, we certainly don't have PAPRs uh, um, and we generally have one N95 a shift, but, but our hospital has done pretty good in, um, you know, trying to rustle up the, uh, you know, the N95s and, and, and gowns and so forth. But we generally, you know, moved uh, in the ICU initially, we were changing gowns between rooms, then they were all COVID rooms. So, you know, generally now people are, you know, using the same gown and, and uh, uh, generally using one N95 a day if they can um, to get through the, the, through the shift. You know, people are, you know, people are, uh, uh, you know, sewing sort of covers for the N95s. I mean, you know, we are getting a lot of uh, support uh, from the community, uh, uh, you know, sewing things and food and so forth and everything. But but I feel like they're doing most of the MacGyvering for us. So. Fair, fair. On kind of a related note, as we've run out of PPE, are different shops restricting people who can work with the COVID patients as far as age or high risk conditions? I know in, uh, recently they pulled any pregnant women away from, uh, from taking care of the COVID patients. Um, I mean, I think we informally try to avoid having the, the elderly, uh, you know, physicians and more senior physicians uh, be overly exposed. Yeah. You know, initially in my hospital, we weren't having, you know, pregnant women. Uh, we were trying to keep them on the known COVID side, but our hospital has just slowly become, you know, almost a full COVID hospital. So you know, our, we, our uh, telemetry areas have been turned into ICUs. The ortho teams are taking uh, care of critically ill COVID patients with, you know, hospitalist and, and intensivist instruction. So, you know, everyone now uh, is basically involved in, in, you know, the COVID response in one way or the no another um, um, if you're working in the hospital. So a couple of questions have come up. People have asked a little bit about, about ECMO, and I think many of us have uh, either wished or hoped to have a VV ECMO in some of these patients. I think Cam mentioned uh, having them when they're still uh, not intubated. But um, ECMO, anyone? Josh? I mean, I, I'm not working in an ECMO shop, and honestly, um, Boston and New York are getting hit pretty hard. So just, I think the logistic reality of this is that we're not going to have access to ECMO. My hope is that we can ventilate these folks well enough so that we won't need it. I also, I think the coagulopathy will be enormously problematic. So we've had huge difficulties maintaining CRT circuits. And I imagine if you had an ECMO circuit, it keeps on shutting down, that'd probably be a problem. Yeah, I think that is going to be the answer. It's just the, 
the, the logistics of it and, and how many ECMO machines there are and, and the problems of getting the circuits. I think it's uh, just practically difficult. Um, are, are you spinning anyone, Adam? No, um, I, I guess there's, there's a bigger point of this that it's hard because um, I, I think everybody in this pandemic realizes that we always have a duty of care to our patients, the individual, and try to do the best thing. But for me, the personal one, if we're talking about we don't have enough N95s, I think committing people uh, with an unknown prognosis to a high resource intensive intervention that we don't really know if it will change their underlying outcome, I, I, I don't know if that's the right thing to do. I, I just don't know. I don't um, I don't know if ECMO would change hyperinflammatory cytokine storm phenotype that we can't totally identify yet. So um, the punchline is no, we have not done an ECMO. Um, we haven't really needed it uh, because to be honest, the, the ones that are not salvageable uh, have a lot of comorbidities and a lot of other things going on. So. Okay. Um someone else asking about the timing of proning for intubated patients uh, and i think um i think we're globally more or less moved away from this sort of automated proning that was initially uh, and it's more of an, an on-demand if we feel we need it and again to reiterate that um it seems like the proning is isn't trying to go for, for recruitment as much as it is like in the rds but just to buy time buy time for the disease to pass um, anyone else have any specific thoughts on the, the timing of proning? You know, I think that if, uh, you know, if you accept this is somewhat different than ARDS, you know, then uh, I think you can move away from sort of the time, not the time constraints, but, you know, typically with ARDS, we're pushing for longer proning times, you know, 14 hours or so, or, um, you know, 16 on, eight off or something like that. I think that, you know, um, if you're willing to go for less, then you can avoid some of the complications uh, of proning. And especially if the resources are getting diminished, um, you know, a lot of, again, a lot of the units are just opening in, in different areas of the hospital and pulling nurses that aren't necessarily uh, uh, having prone patients before. Um, you know, so a lot of NICUs where all the nurses, you know, you get five nurses around and they know exactly where to pat them and they know, you know, to look for edema and so forth, uh, you know, I would say it's probably safer, you know, um, to probably go on the shorter side and maybe more uh, frequently um, than doing long runs. Although, you know, that does require more people uh, more often at the bedside. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, you know, thinking about starting to prone in the ER and, uh, you know, possibly even having you know, the doctors, the residents, and the attendings, and maybe the, the nurse uh, do it. Uh, and I think it is feasible. And if not fully prone, then possibly putting them on their side, um, but just to kind of keep shifting them around. You know, I know people have sort of said like roasting a pig or, or uh, you know, something like that, but just kind of slowly turning them and hoping that, uh, again, while you may not be recruiting, you're shifting blood flow to buy time to hopefully get them through, through this, you know, terrible viral disease. All right. Well, there has been a lot of questions about therapeutics, and I think maybe we'll try to uh, to address that uh, another time if, if we can manage to get everybody uh, back on board, maybe some some different people as well. I think there's a lot of fascinating questions around the anticoagulation, uh, immunomodulation, et cetera, et cetera. And then hopefully in, in a week, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we actually know quite a bit more in a week. Um, so I really, really want to thank everyone to, for having taken the time. You know, time is, is so especially precious these days, uh, whether it's rest or work. So, uh, so thanks for doing this. I, I hope that a lot of people, um, you know, got some some good information out of this, and I hope we uh, help to shape things for the better. Thank you. Thank you. Felipe, thanks for organizing this. Excellent, excellent job. Yes, yeah, great. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. thank you to everyone. Thank you, guys. Great to see everybody smiling and healthy. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. Good Stay night, safe. everyone. Stay safe.